Welcome back to the Purple Worm Podcast, an RPG podcast on Anchor, where four British guys, myself, Colin, Dave and Pete, talk about role-playing games with a British slant. And in this episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Victorian era legend of Spring-Heeled Jack. <laughs> Okay, so if no one minds, I'm going to go on to the yep. the legend that I'm talking about, and that is the legend. It's it's a slightly more sort of modern legend. Um, it's from Victorian times. It's the legend of Spring Heeled Jack, and this is a sort of urban myth slash legend that came around in the Victorian era. First sort of sightings supposedly 1837, but. Like I say, as I said earlier, it was the time when penny dreadfuls and the sort of mass press were coming around. So after that, sightings occurred all over Britain, uh, primarily focused in like Brit in London, the Midlands, and Scotland. Um, London Law, the Legends and Traditions of the World's Most Vibrant City by Steve Rowd, one of the books I, I was talking about earlier, describes the creature as human or even supernatural, reporting that it attacked viciously the people it encountered on the Victorian streets. Reports concerning the appearance of Jack are varied, describing him variously as human, a demon, or even in some sort of slightly more modern interpretations as like a cryptid or some sort of alien creature. Uh, reports at the time, some of the sort of rationales for it, said that it was believed to be a wealthy noble who had springs in his boots, hence the name, enabling him to like effect this sort of otherworldly air and leap over huge walls to escape from pursuers who was like as part of a bet was trying to scare the sort of simpler folk um, but this this element sort of like tapered off a little bit later on and as people focused more on the sort of idea of him as like a monster or a demon um there was a there was a newspaper report in the times i think it was uh, 1839 a, a young lady called jane Allsop was supposed to have answered the door to a policeman um she couldn't really see the policeman because it was dark victoria she went to get a candle came back to the door and when she did this policeman threw off his sort of like you know the sort of cloaks that policemen used to wear at the time um to reveal a frightful aspect for apparently belching flame at her raking her garments with metallic talons and then just like leaping over a nearby wall to effect his escape i mean like i said this is this is um partly focused in the the midlands i mean i remember when i was young i spent a lot of time with my grandparents and they had a lot of those you know those old sort of like wartime like comics compilations like victor and hotspur and stuff like that and a lot of them had these odd pages where they'd have sort of little bits of information dotted between the comics and there was there was like a, a one of the sort of standard pictures of springfield jack which is this guy with this big cloak on this sort of bizarre sort of like rib cage like garment and sort of slicked back hair like a fire coming out of his mouth and i remember sort of reading that and sort of enjoying the picture when i was younger and like i say because it was one that was not only in london and scotland but also in the midlands where i'm from i found it quite compelling to the point where when i did some when i wrote some material for glenn seal's adventures in great london one of my first thoughts was like right i'm going to do a version of that for the setting and I I recast him as Spring Heeled Jock, who, because uh, obviously middle ends it's all sort of tongue in cheek. Um, and taking a tip from the source, well, like some people thought he was a noble, some people thought he was the devil, some people thought he was this. I gave like a number of different possible origins. Like, was he a was he like a Scottish chief, uh, an exiled noble man from like Hadrian's War, or was he actually some sort of devil? And I, in preparation for this, I've been thinking about some ways you could potentially use him in like an RPG game. Obviously, the most obvious is he's a monster. You're the adventurers. You've got to defeat him um, with his ability to breathe flame and jump, and but being able to stand the humanoid side. It's it could be an alright tactical encounter, but um, it, it does sort of reduce it down to like just another pile of like hit points and special powers that the players have to batter. Uh, I, I thought far more compelling for me was if you sort of portray it as a mystery because like, the motivations of this creature in the sort of the body of legends were never really clear he just used to turn up he was never 
he was never understood to have killed anyone. He should turn up, frighten people, occasionally rake them with his claws, and then effect some sort of implausible escape, leaping over nearby walls and such like. So there's plenty of scope for a GM to be able to do what they want within this sort of established mythology. And as we were saying earlier, these, these urban legends and myths are sort of constantly being like recast and remade by different people, different tale-tellers, different audiences. And I thought spring Hill Jack, it could easily be adapted to anyone's particular campaign world, but um, it could also add a bit of depth and uh, a suggestion of the history to your game world. So as we were saying earlier, you often, when people are telling these tales, you often learn more about the person who's telling the tale than the actual tale itself so if like you're talking to a superstitious peasant and you're in a dark and gloomy tavern you might want to play out like the devilish aspect of him you know like oh he's he's lit by hellfire he, he belches baleful flames and he's prowling the streets looking for people's souls whereas if you want to portray a group of aristocrats who are like, well protected they've they've really got little to fear they might just be laughing at the story and regarding it as an amusing jape by one of their own and just like chalking it up as like, oh, you know, it's someone's someone's little fancy or something they, they plan to do. So I, th I think there's a fair few different ways that you could use this. And it's a very sort of striking visual, this whole sort of like devilish aspect. Although I appreciate in sort of like D&D &D and stuff, obviously there's like devils are plenty. I think as well, isn't there a bit of Riddling Reaver in Spring Hill Jack as well? Well, I mean, not, not not so much with the not so much with the riddles because I don't think he ever really spoke to no, anyone. No. But but there there is very much that sort of chaotic sort of yeah. popping up and, and disappearing, and, and disappearing. Yeah, that, that's it. Obviously, we we know like the Riddling Reaver generally, uh, aside from like when he when he kills the guy in the first sort of episode, he, he doesn't tend to just like pop up, kill someone, and disappear again so much. And certainly that that was the case with Spring Hill Jackie. He didn't just turn up, kill people. <laughs> disappear off so no and you know, so there's a slightly shadowed motivation so I, I don't know much about him this thing of him turning up at the door scratching clothes with with his metal claws is there a suggestion that he ravishes or does he do any ravishing is there a no, not, is there not an really. erotic component to any of this not really well initially no it was just a case of he because i think the the sort of like the raking with claws was like a later embellishment so sort of as the as the sort of penny dreadfuls and the, the sort of the, the the mass media at the time, like I say, it was even in the Times, sort of got hold of it. And obviously, they were in the business of selling newspapers. They wanted to sensationalise it slightly. So the whole sort of thing of him like raking people with claws and attacking people was played up a lot more. Whereas right, in the original encounter, yeah, exactly. Whereas in the original ones, it was like I don't even. Think, I'm not even sure that the, the sort of belching flames was mentioned originally. It was just like this sort of odd looking and frightening sort of character would turn up give people a bit of a scare and then by the time they could summon the police he'd leap away and he could leap vast distances and he'd disappear but like i say i think as as we're talking about these tales sort of get embroidered and embellished for for various different reasons and i think sort of to like titillate their their readers the newspapers very much played up that sort of aspect of you know that the whole idea of like a a chaste and pure young woman answering the the door to a to a to a figure you'd expect to be able to trust a, a policeman and then lo and behold he throws back the cloak and actually it's the devil in disguise and he he's got these weird metal claws and he sort of rakes your garments and then leaps away i mean l looking at the picture from the magazine which i just shared with the worms on the, the discord it, it it's a bit of a, a batman looking figure isn't he yeah yeah very much so so even down to, to to the sort of the uh, the, the the headgear. We are, and like I say, one. Where's that from? That one that you've shown us. That that that's from the the uh, the one penny magazine. Yeah, the penny dreadful. Yeah, that's that, does... that's one of the most popular depictions of him. Yeah. How does it tie in with maybe like Jack the Ripper? To, to, to be honest, it it doesn't really initially. There, there are two entirely sort of separate entities. Although, it has got the same name. Yeah, as with a lot of these things, I think sort of later on, sort of elements of the, the. I mean, obviously we know that Jack the Ripper existed, but there's a lot of sort of speculation and sort of legend around that figure because no one to this day knows his identity for certain. So I think various aspects of the sort of legends maybe got sort of jumbled up over time. 
Yeah, it strikes me that they you could easily see some cross fertilization of ideas perhaps going on on there. You know, they like that striking and then the getaway and then mm. the whole mystery and nobody knows and it's all a bit unsolved and the ripping up of stuff and the location and the young sort of women. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I, th- I think as well. I mean, I think originally the the only re- obviously they called him Spring Hill because of this this great leaping that he could do but i think the only reason he was called jack at the time was because it was a particularly common name and um but this 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 could have come from a historical molester of some who was quite possibly women yeah quite possibly that that, that could well be the i mean Mm. interesting we're talking about um let's say connections with jack the ripper and the name uh, as I said to you guys earlier before we started the recording, whilst I was sort of looking into this, I did come across mentions of a, another character with a similar name from Irish folklore called Stingy Jack, <laughs> which is um, it, it's it's the, one of the old stories, you know, where like someone tricks the devil mm-hmm. thinking they're going to get some advantage out of it and inevitably like it doesn't quite work out for them. So in Stingy Jack's case, it's supposed to be the term he... He somehow tricked or entrapped the devil in some way, and he made a deal with him that, like, oh, I, I'll, I'll let you out, um, I'll let you out, Lucifer, but as long as you agree that, like, when I die, I'm not going to go to hell. So the devil's like, all right, f- fair enough. He, he lets him out. The devil goes on his way. Stingy Jack goes on to lead a life of rampant debauchery and committing sins left, right, and centre, like they're going out of fashion. When he, when he dies, his spirit goes down to the gates of hell. And the devil, who's still a bit salty about the whole affair, yeah. it's just like, we made a deal, you're not coming in. So, so he goes up to heaven, and heaven's like, oh, look, at, look at this list of sins, son. I don't think you're getting in here. So he's forced to sort of head back to earth. And the devil's sort of like, I'll tell you what, yeah, you've got to like wander the earth as like a ghost because you can't go into heaven or hell. But, you know, it's a bit of a consolation prize. Like, here's a lantern so you can like see yourself back to the land of the living. And it's supposedly like his ghost sort of wanders around with this like, it's almost like marsh light sort of like lantern so he's stuck in limbo mm. yeah and um apparently this is one of the legends that sort of migrated to america and has sort of like became part of the whole sort of like jack-o-lantern idea oh, yeah. in america oh, yeah. whereas it's supposed to be that um the, the lantern was exchanged for like a pumpkin mm. and and it was one of the many legends that was incorporated into the idea of jack-o-lantern I mean, I, I think those uh, pumpkin-headed scarecrows are, are like far more scary than uh, any sort of scarecrow over here. I mean, terrifying, mm-hmm. aren't they, for, for kids? Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, let's face it, how, how many ho- horror films have you seen where there's like so, someone's in like a farm under a cornfield or mm. whatever, and there's a storm and there's like a flash of lightning, and you see like a, a figure yeah. sort of stood there with that weird sort of like tilt of the head yeah. in the distance, maybe like the suggestion of like the, the pole that's holding them up and you're like oh was it a scarecrow mm. is it is it like whatever's like hunting these people down I mean, it's big, it's like an iconic image well though because because Sca- of the nightmare before christmas my kids love jack no, they're, oh yeah in yeah if, if, jack skellington if, if, if you showed them the old wurzel gummage the original though oh yeah dave i reckon i reckon they're Oh, that's blimey, a different that, idea. That, that was terrifies scary. me. That terrifies me. Yeah, that, that's, for a kids program, I tell mm. you what, that Wurzel Gummidge back in the day was scary enough, man. At times, he <laughs> got nasty. Here's yeah. one for you. Which is scarier, scarecrows or clowns? Lots of people don't, I don't like clowns. I don't know what the thing is about clowns. My kids are terrified about clowns because uh, the, all the it stuff gets passed yeah. around at school. See, 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 so they know th- about Pennywise. They say to me, do you know about Pennywise? I'm like, yeah, I know about Pennywise. Yeah. See, that, see that, my, my thing is about clowns. It's like, I don't have a fear of clowns. I just object to people referring to them as funny. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, if, if, you came, if you came up to me with a comedian, you're like, look, I've got this great comedian for you. He's been telling the same one joke he's got for like 50 fucking years. I, I, I'll be like, no, I'm good, thanks, mate. But like people, for some reason, like regard clowns as funny and they've got like the same sort of handful of jokes that they've had going back to like time immemorial. And I'm just like, you know, surely they need to like get some new material. <laughs> I, I, I think with uh, the clowns is, is, is that big smile that they've got on their face all the time. And I think that's what people find creepy. Well, well, well that's, I mean, uh, there's... Um... Yeah, I mean, we live in Britain. What are you smiling about? <laughs> yeah. We're always yeah. suspicious of people that are smiling. smiling. <laughs> well, as, as we said when we were talking in our episode about what makes a British RPG, <laughs> yeah. everything's shit, just deal with it. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why are you well, smiling? There, there, is a, there is a phrase, I forget the exact phrase, but it's something like... It's the like grinning the f- dog that bites you is the phrase that springs to mind. Oh, no, there, there's, there's actually a phrase which is that it refers to like the fear of the painted smile. And it's it's that whole sort of, you know, they talk about like the uncanny valley when you're talking about things that look sort of human, but they're mm. not quite human. And your brain sort of like d- doesn't like that. It's that sort of similar thing where you see someone who's obviously sad mm. or not happy, mm. But they've got a big smile painted on the face. There's some sort of dissonance between the painted look and what you know to be like underneath it that I think sort of makes some people uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They should use that idea in a film. I reckon it'd make millions. Well, uh, we, we, we all, we all float Phoenix. down here, Dave. <laughs> Jack and Phoenix. He'd be good for the part, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. To be, I can't say anything because I love that film. <laughs> oh yeah, I think it's a, it's a cracking film. Blah blah. I've seen Taxi. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I think we've we've covered a, a sort of smorgasbord of different sort of legends there. Did anyone else have any last thoughts or anything they want to say on legends or myths before we wrap up for the evening? No, I just wonder which uh, expletive uh, Mr. Goblin's henchman is going to use on the next calling. <laughs> and and as he found out, we d- we don't bleep you. <laughs> yeah, we don't we, we don't cut the swears. <laughs> no, we just. We just cut all of Pete's worst jokes. Yeah. That's <laughs> half or, or, or as we like to call them, Pete's jokes. <laughs> uh, oh, that's bad, man. <laughs> Everyone's a critic. See, Pete. even even that joke of mine's going to get cut out. So don't feel too bad. Yeah. <laughs> but um, now, I think the only thing I would say is I would like to revisit it and talk about maybe some more myths and legends at some point because um, it's just such a rich vein. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've 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 barely even sort of scratched the surface in like these these few episodes we've done on it. I mean, as we're talking about, we've all got various different books that we've acquired or legends and myths that we've heard ourselves. Obviously, Dave's uh, the, the the ghost stories I was talking about. I mean, I've got sort of four or five books here, and they're all sort of about an inch thick, and just, oh, just the, ch- and they're, I mean, they're, just, they're all just stuff in Britain. So even. Yeah, the- it's just it's just a wealth and i mean here in wales we, we've got poems going back centuries written on, on these myths as well and because they didn't have books in those days so, so they wrote a poem about it and recited a poem onto the next person and then you had the bards going around and the jesters going around telling all these stories didn't you so, i'll tell you one thing i didn't mention is quite amusing just outside of sheerness where where it was um the royal dock mm-hmm. there's a place called blue town mm-hmm. and it was called blue town because all the dock workers went there they put up wooden houses and they stole admiralty blue paint and this is how bright they were they all painted their houses with this stolen paint <laughs> clearly admiralty blue just outside of the docks <laughs> and you know seemingly nobody battered an eyelid you know they're all blue houses all the same shade of admiralty blue where did they get the paint from a, a total <laughs> blind eye was turned to it. Nice. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Pa- fancy dockers stealing, eh? Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Classic. Okay, well, I-, I think that's about it for this uh, this series of recordings. Like we said, we've only really scratched the surface, and I'm sure we'll revisit this in future episodes. We're, we're planning in future episodes to talk about games that we're running at present. Obviously, we're hoping to finish off the Riddling Reaver as well. Well, I'm sure when Dave's got his... Uh... Well, you haven't got the character, John, that he died. <laughs> oh, my oh, I've got a... I've got a suggestion. Yeah, I did. Yeah, we talked about that, didn't we? I've got yeah, yeah. a character for you. That's yeah. cool. Well, what, what can you what can you say, Peter? It's that OSR lifestyle, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a killer, man. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. It's once... that BLT lifestyle. That's right. BLT. Living that BLT lifestyle, son. But um, you, you don't get a Ruben-esque physique like mine without having eaten a few BLTs, man. But um, I, I'm sure. Once, I'm sure once Dave's wrapped up his um, his sort of like podcasting. Uh, just give a, a quick plug for Dave's uh, podcast there. If you'd like to tell us what the title of your Zine Quest podcast, your Zine Quest uh, Zine is, sorry. I know I said podcast. Oh, there, Mud but... Harbour. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on Mud Harbour. Yeah. Indeed. How, how's that going at the minute? Yeah, it's going all right. Luckily, I set myself a nice long delivery date for it. 
play tested a few bits, changing my mind about some of the pages, but it will it's it will be delivered on time. Uh, but uh, it's taken up a lot of my attention. At the moment. Uh, uh, of course it is. Yeah, I mean, obviously we, we we know it's fully funded on Kickstarter. Are, are there plans to to make it more sort of widely available once all the the Kickstarter madness has dissipated? Or oh, in the in the fullness of time, maybe on PDF. But 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 you know, if if you didn't back the Kickstarter, you've you've missed your chance to have it on paper hand sewn uh, that's that that has gone you'll have to print your own but yeah in a little little while once everybody's got their rewards you know i'll think about sticking it up on drive through so, so there you go that's keep, keep way an ear out keep an ear out and hopefully in the the fullness of time you'll be able to get your own copy of mud harbor on pdf if you've unfortunately missed the kickstarter so I think that's it from us for this evening. So it only remains for me to thank my co-hosts, Dave, Pete and Colin. Hopefully we'll see you next time, or at least you'll hear us if you're listening to the audio version. So until we see you next time, take care, have fun whenever you're playing, and watch out for those purple worms. We'll see you soon.